Please bring in the jury. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ms. Wilmot, you may continue with redirect. Hi, Dr. Samuels. Hi. We were at, I was asking the question, hypothetically speaking, if a woman is attacked by someone that she loves and she feels like she needs to then protect herself, from the attack and ends up having to kill somebody, kill that person. Is that something that would be considered a greater trauma than one of the trivial stresses that we were talking about? Absolutely. And what about, hypothetically speaking, if that woman, there was no indications in her prior life of having any violence at all? Well, that would indicate that the trauma was extraordinary. And in these, extra when, in these extraordinary traumas, is there a greater likelihood of disassociative amnesia? Absolutely. And in these extraordinary traumas, is there a greater likelihood of this disassociative amnesia being more complete? Yes. And what do, what do you mean by complete? Uh, that the duration of the amnesia would, might be longer and the depth of the amnesia would be longer, greater. Okay. And that, so that's directly related to the severity of the trauma? Yes. Now, just because if somebody goes through a trauma such as this, does that necessarily mean they're going to get disassociative amnesia? No. Okay. All right, so... You remember the questions about... Your, you refer to it as a pencil drawing, I think. Your um, hill and valley. Yes. Yes. You have it? Okay. All right. It's Exhibit 530. And I know you said pencil, but it's pen, right? I guess I had a pen here. I thought I had a pen. <laughs> okay. Maybe that is, I don't know. Can't tell. Okay. All right. But it's something that you drew in court yesterday, right? Yes, I did. All right. And is there, it, it's not a very specific graph, is it? No, it's very general and uh, it, it, it's, it's representative of what happens. Okay. And it, representative of what, of what happens when? The uh, interference with memory function under duress over time. Okay. And so when I know that the, the state was trying to get to pinpoint you down on when exactly memory function uh, starts to get impaired, but there is no specific area on this graph because it's a, right? The research hasn't yet given us that answer. Okay. And because this is not a specific, really, graph even, right. c can you pinpoint anything on this particular drawing? No. All right. But what you're, what you're representing, though, is at the bottom of the drawing, we have where the bottom, basically, of the U. That's right. Is that representing where there's memory loss? Where new memories are not being formed. Oh, that's what I mean. I'm sorry. Okay. So where new memories are not being formed, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. So when new memories are not being formed, are we talking about what kind of memories, long-term or short-term? Well, eventually long-term memories are not being formed. Okay. So when we look at this, when we look at this graph and, or, or chart or whatever we want to call it, and we're talking a week or two weeks down the road, if new memories are not being formed in this bottom of this U, two weeks down the road, what does that mean with regard to the person's memory? The person may not remember what went on during that period of acute stress. Okay. And the, uh, when, so that, and that, was that considered long-term memory two weeks later? No, this was sort of intermediate memory. Okay. It's, again, everything is hazy, but long-term memory usually refers to memories that, uh, several weeks out. Okay. All right. And short-term memory refers to what? A short-term memory refers to something like remembering a phone number and then forgetting it a few minutes after you've dialed. Okay. That's short-term memory. Short-term memory. All right. And so when somebody is in this U type thing, when, which would be when they're undergoing acute stress, is that That's right? That's right. So when a person is undergoing acute stress, do they have, do they have their short-term memory? Oh, well, they could still function within that time frame. That's right, because uh, they, they may remember something that happened a few seconds earlier or even, a, you know, 30 seconds earlier. That experience, though, is not being translated into long-term memory. 
Okay. But the short-term memory likely remains. All right. So, so I understand this. When we are in acute stress, if somebody is in acute stress mode, let's say for a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. for example, is that person able to recall within those couple of minutes just those couple of minutes while they are in those couple of minutes. Very possibly. Did that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Then when we talk about those couple of minutes, um, recalling that weeks later, is that what we are more talking about long-term memory? That's correct. Okay. And those couple of minutes of acute stress trying to recall weeks later, is that the portion that is going to be lost? Yes. So... All right, thank you. I want to talk to you a little bit about the MCMI, okay? Sure. Uh, you remember the question when the prosecutor was standing, reading to you from a what appeared to be an article? Yes. Or, and quoting, actually. Yes. And uh, did you ask the prosecutor for a copy of that? I did. Did you ever get one? No. Uh, <laughs> and... Because you didn't get one, do you have any idea what that article was? No. Did you have any ability to look at the entire article? No. Did you have any ability to understand what those pieces, those quotes within that article, how they related to the entire context? No. Are you aware of other articles that discuss um, the use of MCMI and MMPIs? Yes. And in your experience, how many MCMI tests have you done? Thousands, thousands. Thousands? Probably close to, because I used to use it routinely for therapy patients too. Uh, so several thousand probably, 2,000 maybe. Okay. Uh, is there, is there an article called In Forensic Evaluation, a Survey of Psychologists? Yes. And in that article, is it what it says, a survey of psychologists? Uh, precisely that. Okay. And is in the survey of psychologists, what are they, uh, about the MCMI, what are they, what's the survey about? The survey is asking how many time, what percentage of time are MMPIs and MCMIs used in forensic evaluation? Okay. And forensic evaluations mean used for court? For court purposes, yes. Okay. And do you remember in that article what the percentage is of the psychologists who were surveyed, uh, how many, what the percentages of how many times they use the MCMI versus the MMPI? I do. 55% of psychologists in, uh, queried indicate that they use the MCMI in forensic cases on average um, over 118 times per year, and um, that was a survey of several hundred psychologists. And the average length of time they've been using those tests was 18.5 years. So are you telling me that over half of the psychologists that were surveyed use the MCMI? In forensic matters, yes. Okay. So with regard, do you have any problems or issues using an MCMI test? Not if you use it correctly. And did you use it correctly? Absolutely. With Miss Arias? Yes. The psychologist, the, was there an average, and I might have missed this, was there an average age of experience or, or years of experience of those psychologists? I think it was 18.75 years of experience per, on the average for the over 117 psychologists queried. Okay, so these psychologists who know to use the MCMI 55% of the time for forensic work uh, had an average of 18 and a half years of experience? Yes. Much more than three years. Yes. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the MCMI. You were shown some, looks like, some numbers. Exhibit number 541. Yes. This is the, the first page I'm showing you is the profile, yes. is that right? All right. And you talk, let's see, and then the second page, there's base rate scores. Yes. All right, let's talk about the base rate first in a second. Oh, there we go. 
All right. So you see the numbers at the top, 60, 75, 85. Yes. Now, you were continually asked about the number 75 and its special importance. That's right. In the NCMI, is there a special importance to 75 such that if you don't get it, you can't use it? Basically, what it says is that if you reach a level of 75, that's strong evidence that the variable that exceeds 75 is a, is a real, true, significant factor. However, it also is stated for any of these tests that they should not be used individually and alone without comparing it and combining it with other evaluative techniques, including an extensive interview of the client. Okay. So I was not using it specifically to give me a diagnosis, but rather to confirm a hypothesis that I had created previously. Your hypothesis that she suffered from PTSD. Yes. Okay. So let me, let me make this clear, I think. Um, let's say you ignored the rules with regard to MCMI and conducted just the MCMI test. Yes. Okay? So you didn't interview anybody. You didn't look at anything else. You just conducted this test. Yes. First of all, would that be a problem with the way the MCMI is supposed to be used? That's correct, yes. Okay. But second of all, in that situation, is that where the number 75 can be important? Yes. Because why? Well, because when you have a value that exceeds the number 75, uh, that's suggestive of a very strong trait. And that trait, and there's a cutoff point of 75, that considers, it's considered that the trait is strong enough to be able to use it in the formulation of a diagnosis without other information, mind you. Okay. And that's not how you did your evaluation, no. is that right? No. Uh, did, you, did you look at many other things besides just conducting this MCMI? Yes. And when you do that, then how do you look at these scores when you're not using the MCMI alone? You look for relative uh, its strengths. Um, you look for the absolute score plus the relative strengths and then you determine if those relative strengths are high enough to confirm your hypothesis. Okay. All right, and so what we see is that we see the PTSD has 69. Well, uh, you're, oh, you're not sorry. quite, yeah, it is, yeah, <laughs> a little higher. All right, so we're looking at PTSD, we see a score of 69. Right. And we and see anxiety, a score of 75. Correct. And are those the two highest scores? Yes. Do you remember that or do you need to look at it? No, I remember that. Okay. And given that those are two, the two highest scores, what does that mean to you? That means to me that, well, that certainly anxiety is a major feature of PTSD. And the PTSD score was 69, a relatively high score, and the second highest score on that series of variables. And so that, coupled with the high anxiety score, allows me to state that there's a confirmation of my initial hypothesis of the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. And when you say confirmation, what is it that you had that you were also using with besides the MCMI? Well, certainly the the uh, the trauma itself, the interviews with the client. Um, the uh, review of all of the additional material that I reviewed, and uh, also the fact that the PDS test uh, revealed or suggested the presence of PD, uh, PTSD. Okay. Um, would you consider it a complete mischaracterization for someone to say that not having 75 means it doesn't exist? No. Is that a mischaracterization? I believe it is. Would that be irresponsible if somebody were to testify to that? A doctor were to testify to that? Objection, Fauci. Lack of foundation. Otherwise. Would it be irresponsible if a doctor were to come in and say having something not reaching the number 75 means it doesn't exist? I would say so. All right. You were also talked to about... Oh, about the MCMI and how uh, it's the way it was created and it was normed. Yes. What does normed mean? Well, when you do a test like this, uh, you basically give the, the, the sample questions. Actually, you give more than just the 175 that were chosen. 
uh, as test construction can be a rather lengthy and difficult process. But you take a pool of questions and you administer them to people that have previously been diagnosed according to the DSM manual. And you uh, look to see which of the diagnoses are associated with a group of particular responses. Now, in order to get this from the items, very complex mathematical calculations are conducted, the multivariate analysis and so on, which is beyond me at this point. But um, at any rate, they finally select a pool of the items that most well correlate with particular uh, diagnostic categories. That creates the test. Then those tests are scored. The various comparisons between different types of questions are made through this algorithm, and they do a comparison to people that have been previously diagnosed with these particular disorders. And then it basically says this individual's pattern approaches a similarity with people who have already been diagnosed with this disorder. Do you have any idea how long it takes to create a test like this? Oh, it can, take, it, it can take a decade or okay. more, and it's an ongoing process because the validation groups keep changing as society changes. Okay. So this is an ongoing process. All right. So in other words, the MCMI was not created last year? No. Uh, is it something that you said is continually being validated? Yes. So let me get this straight then. You're talking about a, a population of people, let's say, who've already been diagnosed with PTSD, yes. for example. Well, and, right, and other conditions as well. And other conditions. Yeah. I just want to narrow it down sure. to make it easier. Sure. So, for example, you're talking about a population who have people who've been diagnosed with PTSD, mm -hmm. and then do those people take this test? They can, yes. That's right, they do. Okay. I'm talking about the creation. Yeah, the, the uh, right. Okay. The validation study. Yes. Yes. And so those people then would take this test and their test would be scored. Correct. And when their tests are scored, what you're telling us is it's a big mathematical um, calculation. Right. Okay. And once those are scored, that gives you what people with PTSD typically present with. That's correct. Okay. And is that what then... Um, tells you what you would expect to see with somebody who now you don't know if they have PTSD or not for sure, does that then tell you what you need to compare it with? Yes. At the time that uh, this test is given to Ms. Arias, did you already have a hypothesis about PTSD? I did. What was your hypothesis? That she was suffering from a form of PTSD. Okay. And so... Because you had this belief already, and that's based on, on what at that it, time? It, it was based upon things that were said in the interview, even though there were certain things that changed later. There was still enough evidence to suggest to me that she suffered from PTSD. And I wasn't really 100% really sure it came from at that time. But she was referring to the incident at, at Mr. Alexander's. That could be one area. It could have been related to her childhood. It wasn't clear to me. It became clearer later after she began explaining the alternative uh, story as to what happened. Okay. But I had formulated my diagnosis earlier. Okay. And so when you, have, when you think you have a diagnosis, uh, would you want to use a test that is normed to people that have um, psychological issues already? Yes. Such as the yes. MCMI? Yes. Why is that? Well, it's basically looking for confirmation of a diagnostic category that you're already considering. And this test is geared to the DSM. What does that mean when you say geared to the DSM? In, in other words, the diagnostic categories that they're using here have been derived from the DSM. So if this test says there's a high anxiety score, we could turn to the DSM and see what their definition is of anxiety and be feel fairly certain that what's being measured in this test is similar or it's not a, never identical, but similar to what is being identified in the DSM as an anxiety disorder. That's okay. an oversimplification, but that's pretty much it. But that makes it yeah. easier to understand yeah, for us. So, so in other words, so we see on this, uh, we see this the score on here with anxiety, and with the MCMI because it's what was the word you used with regard to the DSM? Uh, well, it correlates with, or it's it, based upon, or okay. it, it overlaps with. All right, so we see this anxiety score, yes. and we see that it's seventy-five. So, if we want to take it and then compared to what anxiety means in the DSM, 
the way that the MCMI defines anxiety, is that going to be very similar to the way that anxiety is defined in the DSM? That's correct. Okay, and is that why the MCMI then, is, does that make the MCMI be a better tool for you to use in, in this situation? In this particular situation, it was precisely what I was looking for. Okay. And you were asked the question, would it be, a, would it be more valid to test to give Ms. Arias a test with regard to the general, po that's normed to the general population. No, in this particular case, it's better to give her a test that's normed to the diagnostic criteria that I'm hypothesizing about, because I wanted to confirm it. Okay. All right, you were asked the question about um, You, 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 were, you were asked the question about uh, whether or not Miss Arias felt uncomfortable when Mr. Alexander had oral sex with her the first time. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And, and she had told you that she was uncomfortable, right? Yes. So the, being that this was the first time that they had that, that Miss Arias and Mr. Alexander had experienced oral sex together. Yes. Did she explain to you why she was uncomfortable? Well, it was the circumstances that made her feel uncomfortable. Meaning what? Well, uh, in other words, now I don't recall if it was the time that she was given the Book of Mormon and, and shortly thereafter oral sex was performed. This would have been the time that she was at... Uh, Objection meeting. Back of foundation. Yes. Uh, approach, please. You may continue. Dr. Daniels, do you remember Ms. Arias talking to you about when she was at uh, a friend of Travis's home? Yes, I do. And it was just shortly after she met Mr. Alexander? Yes, I recall that. All right. And that, did she spend the night? She did. Uh, they had separate bedrooms. She spent the night. Okay. And did, did Mr. Alexander come into her bedroom? Yes, he did. And is that the time when he took off her clothes? Yes. And then he performed oral sex on her? That's what was told to me, yes. Did he perform oral sex on her? Yes, that's what was reported to me. All right. And did she tell you she was uncomfortable? Yes. Why was she uncomfortable? Well, she was in a friend's of theirs home. Um, she was under the impression that premarital sex was not permitted, and uh, there was no preparation for her. He just popped up in her room and, and then and performed the oral sex, removed the clothing and performed oral sex. And did this appear to be too soon for her? Yes, she claimed that it was too soon because normally in a relationship there's a period of time that would transpire before she would be involved sexually with the person. Okay, so regardless of whether or not Miss Arias had any prior sexual experiences, did she feel uncomfortable with Mr. Alexander because it was too soon? Yes, that's what she, that's what she reported. And after that night, did Mr. Alexander take her to church? Yes. You were also asked questions about um, Miss Arias reporting to you that she had uh, regular anal sex with Mr. Alexander. Yes. Or I should say, I guess, anal sex on a regular basis. Yes. Objection to the question. Never asked about regular. Assumes facts not in evidence. He was not asked whether it was regular. Think. Were you asked about whether or not they had anal sex? Yes. Okay. And did Miss Arias talk to you about that? Yes, she did. Um, and at some point later, did she tell you that she did have anal sex or tried anal sex with another boyfriend? Yes, she did. Now, is that something that is important to your ultimate diagnosis of PTSD? No, because if she was complaining that the physical trauma of having the uh, anal intercourse was, was harmful to her, then it might have had an impact on my diagnosis. But it turned out not to be that, uh, I mean, it was not comfortable for her, I recall. But nonetheless, it was not traumatic. And so whether she had had it before with others is not really that significant for my part of the evaluation, for my uh, involvement in the, in the diagnosis, 
was not that critical. All right. And so you were talked to, do you remember being asked about you uh, doing an, an addendum to your report? Yes. And that you did not put this information about her trying anal intercourse prior to Travis a couple of times. That's right. Is that something that you needed to put in your addendum? No. Is it something that changed anything with regard to your diagnosis no. or what you felt about acute stress or PTSD? Not at all. Do you remember being asked the question about uh, whether or not Ms. Arias talked to you about pictures of breasts on uh, Mr. Alexander's computer? Yes, I remember that was mentioned. All right. Do you have any memory of how many computers Mr. Alexander had? No, I do not. Do you even know that? No, I don't. Uh, did Ms. Arias ever talk to you about how many computers he had? No. And did she ever, did you guys ever talk about a timeline of when she was talking about these pictures that she saw? No. So, and do you know the timeline of when Miss Arias knew Mr. Alexander? That she met him in 2006? Yes, well, I have a timeline, not, not specific as a timeline, but through my notes, I have various dates. Uh, I could create a timeline if necessary. Okay, well, my question is, though, is that, is that when she was talking to you about these pictures on his computer, was there ever a, a specific time that she saw them in 2006 versus 2008? No. And was there ever a specific discussion as to which computer she might have seen them on? No. Objection assumes there were two computers. We know there was only one computer. Judge, that's overruled. Your answer was no? no? My answer was no. And with regard to the gun, do you remember her telling you? Objection being overruled. Do you remember her telling you that? She thought that if she had the gun, it would stop him. Just yes. Like a foundation which time? Sustained. Well, there was only one time she had a gun. Are we talking? Like a foundation. Okay. So the first time that she talks to you about um, what a what actually happened. Let's see. The first time that she actually talks to you about what actually happened was was when? Do you remember? Um, I think it was in sometime in April. Of what year? Of uh, 2010. Would that be April uh, 11th? Yeah, I believe. Let me, let, let me look. Yes, April 11th. All right. And on April, and, and honestly, I, I'm not sure if this is the first time she talked to you or not, but I know on April 11th, she's in, in your notes on April 11th of 2010, is she talking to you about what happened with regard to June 4th of 2008? Uh, yeah, she's talking about what happened on the actual day of the, uh, the incident. Okay. She's also looking at We could also have those marked. Actually, did I have well, you, I have clean Oh, those are marked? These are marked, Your Honor. I'm just looking through my notes. Oh. You need to tell us the exhibit number you're referring to. Okay, well, I, uh, I was actually looking at exhibits 543, 537, and 542 because they, what you're looking for may be on here. Okay. And they're out of context, so I have to review them. Okay. Um, are the notes marked for April 11th of 2010? No. Okay. Do you want to pull those? Sure. is the April note. April. On the second page there, does she talk to you about the gun? Objection. Um, improper refreshing of recollection. He doesn't say he doesn't remember. So he's basically going to read his notes. Improper impeachment. Sustained. Do you remember which, what you specifically wrote in your notes? Could you tell us verbatim? Not from Object. memory. Object. Relevant as to what he wrote. The relevant inquiry is whether or not he remembers what she said. Does she not have speaking objections? Objection? May we approach? All right, Dr. Samuels, on April 11th of 2010, do you remember that, did you interview Ms. Arias that yes, day? Yes, I did. All right, and on that particular day, 
let's not refer to your notes yet. On that particular day, do you remember specifically if she talked to you about the gun? Yes. And do you remember if she talked to you about what happened in the closet and the bathroom? Yes. Uh, she was uh, fleeing his uh, approach. She ran into the closet. Uh, remember there was a gun on a shelf, um, pointed it towards him, and I recall her writing, telling me rather, and I wrote that she was hoping that the sight of the gun would hold him at bay. Okay. She, was she hoping to create distance? She was, in fact, said that she was trying to create distance between herself and Mr. Alexander. Okay. And specifically, do you recall what she said with regard to uh, being in the closet or running out of the closet when the gun goes off? Um, I think she was out of the closet at that point. Do you need to refer to your notes at all? I would like to, if I can. Absolutely. And tell me when you're finished. Yes. And, and which exhibit are you referring to? I beg your pardon? Which exhibit are you referring I to? I am referring to exhibit 548. Okay. Second page towards the middle of the page. Okay. And it said he was... It's okay. You don't have to read it. Okay. So just if you want to refresh your recollection. No, I remember. Okay. Okay. Uh, she ran into the, uh, the closet and was running through the closet, and that's when the gun was uh, held up. Okay, and you ha did you have a note in there about her, uh, that she, did she run out the opposite door? She ran out the opposite door, it was apparently an adjoining closet. A adjoining to the bathroom? Uh, adjoining, I think it was in between the bathroom and the hallway of the bedroom, I'm not sure. Okay, um, did she tell you, uh, and you can refer to your notes if you need to, did she tell you about running out of the closet door? She did say that. And... Uh, when she, after she runs out of the closet door, did she talk about holding the gun up? Yes. And if she runs out of the closet door, where would she have been? She would have. I'm not beyond the scope of his of his oh. understanding. Lack of foundation as to this question. Approach. Did she, did she tell you that she ran into the bathroom? Yes, she did. Oh. And so when I'm asking you the question of if she ran out the door, the closet door, where did she run into, did she ever tell you where she ran into? She ran into the bathroom. Okay. And when she runs into the bathroom, did she talk to you about pulling the trigger? Yes. And did she talk to you about the gun going off? Yes. Did she say uh, what happened after the gun went off? He let out a scream. She didn't notice blood, but he kept coming towards her. Okay. Did they fall on the ground? They fell on the ground. Um, and and in your okay. When they fell on the ground, did she talk to you? Um, did she describe to you what happens on the ground? Yes, they wrestled, and she finally was able to get up and flee. Well, did she tell you that he pulled at her shirt? Yes, he did pull at her clothing. All right. On April 21st, did she talk to you again about what happened? Yes, she did. And is this something that, you, that you're doing on purpose? Are you asking her what happened? I'm asking her a second time, and there was maybe even a third time, uh, what happened? And that way, there's an attempt to, through successive approximations, get a better understanding of what actually happened. When people tell stories, they frequently will tell different parts of the story, not because of their, the fact that they're lying necessarily, but because of the moment that they're revealing it, they only remember that. And what we find is that if someone has a pre-made story, has made up a story, usually that story is very consistent time after time after time. But here, each story was a little different, and I was able to synthesize what I thought was the most likely occurrence. Not accurate 100%, but reasonable. Okay. So what you were saying is with made-up stories, do you hear, when you hear made-up stories from people, do you hear the same verbiage over and over? Almost, yes, you do. Um, and do you hear the way things happened exactly the same every time? If not exactly, very close to the same. Sometimes okay. the same words are used. Okay. Um, and when somebody's recalling something that actually happened, are there sometimes de small details or details that are left out one time but then told another time? Yes. 
Does that mean that it didn't happen necessarily? No. It means that something like what was told, the average of all of those times, likely happened. That's okay. what it means. All right. And is that, is that what you find in your practice in speaking with thousands of people over your years of practice? Yes. All right. So on April 21st, did you, did you meet with her again? Yes. And during the time that you met with her, at some point, did you talk to her again about what happened uh, on June 4th? Yes. All right. And if you need to refer to your notes, let us know. I would, well, I would just like to have them available. That was April 21st. April 21st. I have that. Okay. If I need it, I'll refer to And what exhibit number is it? That's exhibit number 537. Five thir- okay. All right. Uh, all right. Did she tell you specifically at whether or not she was in the closet when the gun goes off. I have to look at my notes. Please do. Judge, may I direct into the page to make it quicker? Yes. Okay, one, yes. two, three, four, five, fifth page. Yeah. Uh, yes, well, she doesn't talk specifically okay. about the closet. Okay. Well, does she talk about running into the closet? Yes, she talks about running into the closet. And does she talk about creating a distance? Yes, she was trying. Again, she repeated that she was trying to create a distance. Uh, And does she tell you that she uh, goes for the gun? Yes. Sustained. And after she talks about, does does she talk about the gun? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Does she talk about getting the gun? Yes. Okay. And after she talks about getting the gun, does she say where she goes? She ran out into the hallway. Into the hallway or into the bathroom? Hold on. Let me see. I just want to be sure. This is before the gun goes off. Oh, okay. Well, what I'm looking at, perhaps I'm not looking at the right place. It says she rolled over. Read. He says it does not refresh his recollection. Sustain. Okay. She runs down the hallway. Oh, no, don't answer. Hold on. Okay. Well, I may mean, we let the uh, answer stand? No. So you may approach. Or yes, you may approach. You may continue. All right. Doctor, I'm going to ask you to look at a specific page. Okay. From April 21st. Mm-hmm. And I just want to compare, because I know these pages are not numbered. Right. I'm looking at the fifth page under the first line that's drawn across. Uh, Is there a line at the top? Yes. After the uh, first paragraph? Yes. Okay. And can you read through that paragraph for us? The the very top one or the bottom, the one below the line? Well, can you read through the rest of that page to refresh? Sure. She runs out. No, 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 not out loud. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. It, so this way, so that so that when I ask you questions about sure. what happened, process, he knows. Uh, overall, and then let us know when you've finished reviewing it. Okay. All right. Does, is is there a reference in, did, do you remember after reviewing your report, do you remember better what she told you? Well, I do remember that she ran into the closet. Okay. And then she said that she eventually ran out of the closet. Okay. Um, and were you trying to describe where the closet was located? Yes. And how did you do that? Well, she described it to me. Okay. Because she had told me once before about the closet, so I combined that with what I had learned previously. Okay. Um, and that it was adjoining to the bathroom? Yes. All right. Um, what did she say about uh, shooting Mr. Alexander? Well, she said the gun went off. It wasn't her intent. Okay. Uh, what was her intent? To keep distance between him and her. Did she talk about her feelings? How she felt at the time? She was terrified. She was frightened. And did she talk about what happened as the gun goes off? What was Mr. Alexander doing as the gun goes off? Well, I'm not sure now if it's exactly this, but I know he... Well, that's okay. If you, if you need to refresh your recollection, you can look at your report again. Oh, okay. Right, where the same page. Same, same page, okay. Um... And then tell me when you're finished reviewing it. Okay. 
Okay. So did she talk to you about what Mr. Alexander was doing when the gun was going off? He was lunging towards her. Okay. And did he, did she talk about after he falls on top of her, what he did? Yes. She did. And what is he doing then? Well, he was on top of her and she knew enough to indicate that uh, he was a wrestler and she realized and recollected at that particular moment that that was a very disadvantageous position for her. So she tried to get away and ultimately was able to get up. And after she gets up, does she say where she runs? Uh, but, well, I would see the hallway, but I know that, yeah, I see the hallway in this particular article. Hold on. What is the objection? The, the objection is that he's not being allowed to finish the question, the answer. In other words, he says he sees hallway. We're, lack of foundation, where does he see it? I didn't interrupt him. With your okay. response. I recall that she was saying that she was running down the hallway. Okay. And after that, does she talk to you about whether she has any strong memories after that? No, she does not have strong memories after that. Okay. All right. Did she talk to you again uh, on June 9th of 2010? Uh, well, I have notes for June 9th, but I don't think they're admitted here. Oh. Should I okay. pull them out of here? Go ahead and pull them out. On, so on June 9th of 2010, do you remember that you spoke to Ms. Arias uh, again about what happened on June 4th of 2008? Yes, it was a rather lengthy session. Okay. And did you speak to her about grabbing the gun. Do you remember that? Yes. And do you remember if she talks to you about running out a door? Yes, she did. And did she talk about running out of the closet door? Yes, she did. Did she talk to you again about whether or not she planned to shoot? The objection of previous ruling. May proceed. So, Doctor, did she did she talk to you about whether or not she planned to shoot? She did. And did she did she plan to shoot? No, she did not plan to shoot. I would like for him to tell the story, leading, sustained. Do you want me to lead him? Would that be easier? what she said with regard to the gun? Well, I remember being, that gun was being discussed several times, and I'm not sure that it's specific to these particular notes. Okay. But I remember... Well, let's, let's... I'm talking specific to this particular meeting. I'd have to refresh so, my memory. Then let's do that. Okay. Um, may I help him with the page? Yes. Thank you. Okay, one. Two. On the twelfth page. The third from the end. Yes. And my question while you're reviewing that is, did she talk to you about uh, her intentions with the gun? Yes. Okay. Let yeah, me know when you finish. At one point she didn't show him that she had the gun. She didn't plan to shoot. It was said again. Somehow the gun went off. He, I don't remember if she said specifically that he screamed at that particular time, but that wasn't enough to stop him. Okay. And uh, specifically, did she, did she talk to you about running out the door again? She ran out the door. And did she specifically tell you where she ran to in these notes? And if um, you need to refer to them. Said, he, I, I, I have to review just to double check because I want to be sure. I don't want to make a mistake. She ran into the bathroom. Okay. Um, And after she ran into the bathroom, what did she tell you? Do you remember? Um, 
I'd have to read you my note for Go ahead. to be specific about that. She turned around and pointed the gun at him, but he did not stop. Okay. Did she talk to you about the gun itself, whether with regard to whether it was loaded or not? She was not sure whether it was loaded or not. Again, it seems as if her goal was to show the gun to get him to stop. Okay. Is that based on all the things that she told you? Yes. She indicated she had never fired a gun before. Okay. And did she say what happens with the gun after she fires it? It was dropped. How was it dropped? Um, I, Do you need to refer to your notes? I'd like to refer to my notes, so sure. I don't want to make any errors here. Um, he hit her, and then she dropped the gun. Okay. And then it led to the struggle. Okay. Now, did, does it specifically say that there was a struggle? And no, go ahead. Not in this particular uh, note, but they wrestled on the ground. Okay. Um, and do you recall whether or not how she was able to get away? Um, she managed to get up and started running down the hall. All right. And with regard to this particular note, uh, do, is this where does she discuss him being a wrestler? Yes. Did she talk to you about some of the things that uh, Travis said to her? Well, yes, uh, he was uh, very angry. He called her names and threatened to kill her. And do you remember the specific quote about his threat to kill her? I'd like to be able to read that. Sure. Okay. It's on the second to last page. Yeah. He said, I'm going to effing kill you, bitch. Okay. And it's not effing, right? Did she use the F? She used the real word. Okay. Oh, good. This is probably a good time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow, you do not need to be here until 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock tomorrow. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Have a nice evening. Thank you, guys, for the Please approach.